The tree's history is so important to the folks that have lived around here and passed by and come to visit. It's, it's a renowned tree and the, the storyline is a, a fascinating one. And here was this one redwood tree growing there. The tree is a, is a definite lure. The resilience that the tree has demonstrated is, is something that's very remarkable. What I'm most pleased to see is that the Walter Hayes fourth and fifth graders come here every year. And when, when all the kids learn history in fourth and fifth grade, California mission system, just the whole uh, gold rush era, with, with that, that whole time in play, this tree comes up and they want to learn about it. And so when the kids come and see the tree, where yes, we read about, you know, Father Sarah camped here in disguise. When they were coming down, came out onto the Santa Clara Valley, looked out and in the distance, they saw this one spire. The El Palo Alto was the largest tree in the vicinity. Standing out above all the oak trees and other things, and that's where they sort of head for it. And so when the kids come, they can actually touch history right here, a thousand years old. For 20 years, it was my privilege to be one of, one of the chain of stewards to care for this tree over my shoulder here. This is the El Palo Alto Redwood tree. Over a thousand years, this tree has had a lot to deal with. And some of the things that I'm aware of that this tree has had to deal with health-wise, well, you see behind me the train trestle. When the railroad was being built in the 1850s, um, 60s, down from San Francisco to San Jose. Once they came around a certain point in San Francisco and looked off in the distance, they could see the tree. And it's, for an engineer, it's very easy to say to your crew, build it toward that tree. It was a landmark that they could uh, keep everyone focused on the route that it had to go up to that point. When the railroad was originally put in, it was a coal-burning, smoke-laden train. The tree was being smothered with um, wood smoke and coal smoke from the trains that passed that were maybe 10 or 15 feet away from the tree. And so for 50 years, half a century, this tree was being cooked. Even worse, below ground, the roots to this El Palo Alto Redwood were tapped into the water table. Well, since the valley was inhabited 1850 after the gold rush, San Jose and this whole region was populated by farms and orchards. They tapped wells and actually they detected the water table lowered so deeply out of the reach of the El Palo Alto Redwood that it was starving for water below and the top was getting cooked so the tree looked like hell for a long time until they started capping the wells of, to water table would come back. The Santa Clara Valley Water District was created for that purpose. Once they stabilized that, the tree started coming back to life. The water table came up and more foliage came onto the redwood. One thing that I appreciated and thought was nice was the fact that uh, Dave Doctor, he asked me to train him how to do the scanning on the trunk. And I thought that was very nice and I appreciated it at the time because uh, I didn't want to get up on scaffolding 14 feet up on a tree, but Dave did. So Dave was uh, hanging from the top part of this tree from a, on a rope and he went on the other side of the wall and did the scanning of the concrete wall. We uh, tied a rope to the tree and suspended Dave over the side. So there I am going over the edge with uh, all that rigging and stuff. So we're checking out there. And uh, he actually did uh, four scans down the wall, down to 17 feet. 
And the way the radar technology works is there's a little survey wheel on the back of the antenna, which Dave was using. And every two tenths of an inch that that wheel would turn, it would shoot a radio wave through the concrete and into the soil and it would reflect off the moisture that's inside of a root of a tree. So he was able to document all the roots just below the El Palo Alto here, which I really appreciated because at that time in my life, I could not do things like that anymore. But uh, I had someone that was so uh, interested and excited about the El Palo Alto redwood that he was willing to risk his life for the tree. <laughs> George Hood was one of the, uh, my, my favorite guys that I read about, though I've never met him. But he, George was an arborist uh, with the Parks Department from the 1950s to, through the 60s. And when he was taking care of this tree, he, he saw the tree, uh, the foliage was really sickly looking and he wanted to help improve the health of it. He knew his dad went over to this tree and sunk uh, terracotta pipes around it and carried water over here and poured water down the pipes. But when George got in charge of taking care of this tree, he came up with a plan. He called it a fool the redwood plan to try to fool this redwood into thinking there was coastal fog coming and watering the leaves every single day. How could he do that? George Hood put a pipe, an irrigation pipe at the backside of that tree and went all the way to the top and at the top, he put a mister that actually mimicked the natural habitat that the coastal redwoods normally enjoy, which is along the coast in, in the mountainous regions where they get the morning fog and copious amounts of rain, much more than what we get here in the valley. When they did install that misting system, I think that was the turning point in the health of the tree. It was just a good idea that a guy, one of the stewards had, and he tried to fool the redwood into thinking it was happier and getting watered. Another conservation effort that happened that I think saved the tree's life personally, where in the 1990s, Actera, the native plant group, uh, came up with an idea to put native plants all around the area here. Irrigation came in and just the surface water irrigation here created an environment of the soil where the tree responded immediately. That tree put out a whole new root plate right on about two feet underground. There's a whole new root plate of biomass growing and living off all of this added water of the surface. Major effect from that, there's more suckers and sprouts happening on that tree since the 1990s uh, than years before it. Plus, this the El Palo Alto Redwood used to be exactly 110 feet high, where the, the dead top was cut off. It had to be topped because the top part of the tree broke off, so the, that area had to be cleaned with a, a nice straight cut. Since this irrigation system has stimulated a new root plate growing under here for vigor, this tree now put out a side shoot and it's getting taller. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's about 121 feet in height today, which is a lot better than what it was prior. So the tree is actually getting taller. There's more green biomass to that tree now, and the roots are healthier. That's a good, all a good thing. So we started our evaluation on the El Palo Alto Redwood in 2013, and we just finished it in 2023. So it was something that turned out to be very important in my life as an arborist, to be able to uh, 
uh, work on a tree that was as old as the Al Palo Alto redwood and the historical significance of the tree. Uh, the more I looked into the history of the tree, uh, what it stood for, and what it had been through, uh, the more intrigued I became and wanted to do this evaluation, which I did as a pro bono uh, project. It was just for my own satisfaction. Satisfaction of this evaluation came as I got to research the history of the tree. Uh, back in the late 1800s, Leland Stanford, he used uh, large timbers or railroad ties, you might say, and he built a wooden retaining wall. But it was interesting is when we used the ground penetrating radar to locate the roots of the El Palo Alto. And what we were able to see was what we think was the original structural support system that Leland Stanford used in his original wood, wooden retaining wall. And this was done, I think, back in 1902 or three, about the time the Wright brothers were getting ready to fly their plane. That's, that's history on this tree. It goes way back. Another oddity of this tree is structure. There is a, a big branch that comes out and goes towards the south. That side branch, um, we call that our dog leg, it is such an interesting uh, abnormal side branch. It wants to become a whole separate tree, it looks like, you know. But one of the neat things, interesting things about this tree, knowing that there's branches, kids like to climb it, okay, everybody likes to climb. But did you know that after Leland Stanford University was originally founded, there was a regular practice of that each one of the classes would have a class race who could place their flag at the top of El Palo Alto Redwood first. In the early days, the Stanford students were wild and crazy. Some of them still are today. And most of them got up and got down more or less safely. There's a couple stories about ones who needed to be rescued. When the kids used to come and climb the, the tree, they'd have to start somewhere. Check this out. In here, embedded in the tree, is gigantic railroad spikes. There's one there, the other one's up here, and there were several going on up. But this one down here, when I first got here 20, 25 years ago, this spike was sticking that far out. So this tree trunk has grown around that spike, but those probably were the original spikes used. I would imagine. Um, no, no information of how much alcohol was involved in those stories. Every year you get a whole new crop of Stanford students with plenty of time on their hands. Uh, yeah, and so the tree is a, is a definite lure. That happened until one year in 1909, one of the kids got stuck up in the tree after dark couldn't get down. I wonder if that's the branch he got stuck on. But he had to be rescued by the rest of the school university. Total embarrassment. From that day on, the headmaster prohibited El Palo Alto from being climbed for this class contest. It's totally a great story, you know. Here's an interesting part of the story. The city has a plaque that was from 1985. In it, it's, it's a certificate from NASA that verifies the fact that there were seeds from the El Palo Alto Redwood that went up in the Challenger spacecraft into outer space and came back. These seeds are actually packed in plastic behind, uh, behind the frame. But it's been asked of me, how did they get in the Challenger aircraft? Well, there was an individual that lived in Palo Alto that worked for, I don't know, NASA Ames probably, Lockheed Martin, uh, Moffett Field was here. The 50s after World War II was rampant with aerospace technology. And NASA had astronauts from all over. One of the astronauts lived right here in Palo Alto. And every astronaut was asked, you can take something personal into outer space, what would it be? This guy said, I would like to take 
seeds from El Palo Alto and up the seeds went. Uh, it's neat because the, the, the plaque and the frame uh, signed by the payload specialist authorized these seeds to actually be able to go up into outer space. Uh, there is a tree growing in El Palo Alto Park, I believe that's where it is, that were nurtured from those, at least one of those seeds. All of this together is amazing provenance of, of where these seeds and where this tree has been. Even though it's so well grounded, its seeds have been as far as space. Yeah, isn't that a great piece of provenance story? I love it. I think the tree represents resilience, and I think it represents the point that you never want to give up. Because looking back on the history of the tree, all of the different things that has happened around the tree, this, this tree was originally twin trunks, and the story says that one blew over in a storm back in the 1800s, I believe. Yet it was an event that affected the tree. And the environment that the tree eventually found itself in, because at one time this was just an open field. And then the railroad came in and it changed the environment around the tree. What will this tree uh, incur in the future? Will there be global warming or weather change. Um, and one of the most immediate things that is coming up is Caltrain is proposing to replace the bridge. <gasps> now, if that were to be removed and replaced with new concrete embuttressments and new engineering stuff, messing around with the roots of that tree, that seriously could be a jeopardizing event for the tree. So uh, Caltrain, the, the Creek folks, the city that owns this land, all, all parties that have some function and reason to be doing stuff around the tree need to be very sure that they're not impacting it in any way. The tree today, almost 1,100 years old, it's not the prettiest tree, but I think the beauty of it is the history, the resilience, and the fact that the tree never gave up. In spite of the mountain-like obstacles that it, it must have had to deal with. And that can be a lesson for you and I today. Caution in the future. Learn lessons from the past, huh? <laughs>